Ladies and gentlemen, a very good afternoon. On behalf of the Institute of South Asian Studies, ISA, I warmly welcome you to the public lecture. We're delighted to welcome the Minister back to the Institute of South Asian Studies. ISA has benefited from a close law session with the Minister last year, and I'm very happy that he has once again chosen ISA as the venue for his lecture on a topic that is of immense interest to Singapore. The Minister will be speaking on India's external environment and current foreign policy challenges. So without further ado, it's my pleasure to welcome the Minister to deliver his lecture. Minister, please. Uh, if I couldn't see <coughs> Mr. Sami Ko, Ambassador at large, It's a great pleasure for me to be here today. But the topic of my address today is rather broad. And this necessarily implies that I have to be selective. The biggest development of the past two decades in our continent has been the evolution of the forces of Asian reintegration. <coughs> our engagement with our international partners, both in our immediate and extended neighborhood, is testimony to this phenomenon. Prime Minister Dr. Manmohan Singh articulated India's vision of uh, regional economic integration at the last SARC summit held in Maldives in November last year. This vision is based on enhanced intra-regional trade, both in goods and services, investment flows, and enhanced regional transport and communication links. We agree that terrorism poses a continuing threat to peace and security. I accompanied uh, Prime Minister Dr. Manmohan Singh on his historic visit to Bangladesh in September last year. The orientation of our discussions was directed towards creating a mutually beneficial framework for raising the living standards of people of our two countries. India has conveyed in no unclear terms that it is committed to the unity, sovereignty, and territorial integrity of Sri Lanka. It is our hope that the vision and leadership that resulted in an end to armed conflict will now be employed in the quest for genuine political reconciliation. A stronger India-China economic relationship can make a direct contribution to the quality of life of over two billion people. China has emerged as the largest trading partner of India and our engagement with China is now multifaceted. A few weeks ago, I hosted a successful exchange in New Delhi with colleagues from ASEAN on a whole gamut of uh, issues. The challenges to greater economic integration between us, driven by sentiments of protectionism, have been addressed through the implementation of the India-ASEAN Free Trade Agreement on Goods. India and ASEAN have put in place one of the largest free trade agreements on goods. We are aware of the challenges that are preoccupying the international community, which can adversely impact on the process of Asian reintegration. The global economic crisis, especially in the industrialized nations of the West, 
as thrown up challenges of constricting export markets and slowdown of inward foreign investment flows from many Asian countries, including India. I would like to convey my deep appreciation to Professor Kanta Yang uh, and uh, his team for giving me uh, this uh, opportunity and I consider this an honor to interact with all of you. Ladies and gentlemen, Excellencies, thank you very much for your patience here. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Kanta for giving me this honor to moderate the Q&A session with Minister Krishna. <laughs> I've invited Singapore's former High Commissioner to India, Mr. C. Chakman, to ask a, a friendly question. <laughs> I read recently a report called NAM 3.0, submitted by a group of professional uh, uh, policy thinkers in India. Uh, the, the report focused a lot of attention on India and relation with Pakistan and China. Uh, unfortunately, I, I find that in my view that instead of recommending how to improve relations between India and China, the report went on to recommend how to fight a war with China. <laughs> so, Mr. Minister, I think the world wants to see a better relation between India and, and, and China and can do common good. My specific question is, uh, in which area and in what way can India and China cooperate to act as a positive force you know, in international relations and in world affairs? Dr. Manmohan Singh said once that uh, there is space both for India and China in the world. And if there is development in both of our countries, because you know, the, today, China and India are recognized as growth engines you know, in the global context. I think it could be complementary to each other. It, it need not necessarily be in competition, but it could be complementary to each other. Hence, it is necessary uh, that uh, we have to look at uh, the India-China relationship in this perspective. <coughs> Thank you, thank you, Minister. Um, I requested Dr. Chowdhury, uh, former Foreign Minister of Bangladesh, to ask a second friendly question. <laughs> Today, I would like to say that it's more than aspiration of a single political party in Bangladesh. It goes beyond to the wider masses who want very good relations with India. You're very right to refer to the visit of the Prime Minister as historic and uh, refer to the number of accords that were signed. Could I uh, draw your attention, however, to one accord uh, that was not signed and which was with regard to the sharing of Tista waters. And you would appreciate that there is a burgeoning sense of angst uh, in Bangladesh over this. Do you, sir, see any forward movement on this issue at any, at any time soon? Talks are going on between Bangladesh and India on a number of issues. And the uh, issues that you mentioned is also one of them. Uh, you know that India is a federal uh, country. The Constitution of India clearly defines the powers of the state, the powers of uh, the union, and there is what is known as the concurrent jurisdiction. Now, water is uh, the exclusive uh, prerogative of uh, the state governments. So we will have to carry uh, the concerned state government when we are dealing with uh, international treaties. You can take a question from the his Excellency the Ambassador of the Republic of Korea, Mr. Zhu. India, along with Pakistan, uh, are two of the three countries that stayed outside uh, nuclear non-proliferation treaty and usually known to have developed nuclear weapons. Uh, so obviously, uh, India has a 
a great deal of stake uh, in this issue. So I would like to know um, uh, what kind of position does India have when it comes to issues like nuclear security? I think uh, reasonable conditions, equitable conditions, should be created so that all countries have signed the non-proliferation treaty. But in the meanwhile, in order to take stock of uh, uh, the fallout, if any, of uh, the developments on the nuclear status of a country, I think it is necessary that uh, we should put our heads together and then uh, try to work out a consensus as to how to safeguard humanity from any possible danger. I think this concludes the Q&A session. Uh, Minister, not all the questions were equally friendly, but you answered all of them very well. And we thank you very much for sharing your time.